The human body is an amazing thing. It is capable of so much. And when it comes to sports, of course, knowing how to take care of it is important. But how many of us really know what's going on under the hood? What's really going on every time we throw a punch or swing a kick? It's an intriguing question. Today, we take a look and find out, starting with the driver of the body, the brain. Now, as we could probably estimate, the brain is alive during any sort of physical activity. I mean, there is a reason why it's recommended for conditions such as depression, after all. Neurotransmitters become far more active, with dopamine and serotonin flooding the brain, while adrenaline also comes into play, which will be quite relevant in sparring, but most active are areas known as the prefrontal cortex and the temporal lobe. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for the regulation of thought, action, and emotion, serving in short as a filter between good ideas and bad ideas, while the temporal lobe measures our sensory responses to the world around us, as well as being key in communication and access to memory. Unfortunately, these are areas that are more likely to be affected by neurological diseases, such as Alzheimer's or dementia. But good news, because with the increased blood flow brought about by exercise, new brain cells are built and maintained, lessening the risk of developing these diseases. These areas again light up like a Christmas tree when doing form work or pad work, as long-term memory of these sequences are tested along with balance and coordination. While in the decision centered to areas of the brain, such as the orbital frontal cortex, which regulates incoming signals from the body, or the aforementioned prefrontal cortex, both working overtime as decisions and plans are made and unmade, as the unpredictable nature of sparring demands more of the mind and the body. It should probably also be mentioned the amount of risk when it comes to martial arts in terms of the amount of knock to the head. The correlation with degenerative disorders should not be something to ignore. With there being many unfortunate cases of where people who enter the ring or the octagon or even people who spar regularly developing neurodegenerative diseases as well as cases of neuroatrophy. The nervous system is of course responsible for feeling all around the body. The central nervous system being located in the brain and spinal cord, receiving and processing information from the peripheral nervous system. The parts that send those signals and carry out the commands of the brain. Responsible for all that feeling and pressure we feel from the nerves all over the body. Where this really becomes interesting is during sparring. When in the middle of such a scenario as sparring, the body is flooded with adrenaline. The brain is making and unmaking decisions. You're under higher stress than usual, and whereas normally you would feel pain, you don't. Epinephrine is released, blocking pain receptors, and therefore dulling the feeling of pain until later once the adrenaline is dumped out. But now let's talk about the backbone of the body, quite literally, with the musculoskeletal system. And I don't think I need to tell you the effect that martial arts or any sort of physical exercise can have on the old muscular system, but I think I will anyway. As we exercise, blood flow increases to muscles, incidentally reducing that blood flow to areas such as the kidneys, causing you to also need to pee less, which is nice. As we exercise and tense and flex and stress, the muscles develop micro tears in the microfibrils within muscle fiber. These micro tears are afterwards repaired with a steady supply of nutrients, which causes not only the tears to be repaired, but also for new microfibrils to grow, overall increasing the size or overall strength of the muscle. Yes, very interesting, but quick question, does any of this apply to the bones? It's a weird question, but as it turns out, yes. With repeated strain on the bones in, say, the forearms during defensive work, where again, microscopic breaks in the bone surface are repaired by the influx of nutrients, not only repairing the damage, but also adding an additional layer to the bone, making it harder overall. There! Now, we'll be sure to get back to the main video in no time, but first of all, I need to talk to you about something. Now, we recently reached 1,000 subscribers here on this very channel, which I must say, first of all, thank you to everyone who has subscribed, whether you've just subscribed recently or you subscribed two years ago. Thank you so very much. I couldn't be prouder of this amazing community that we have built on this channel. But having said that, 99% of you people that haven't watched these videos are not subscribed. I mean, why are you not subscribed? For one thing, you get to press a big red button. Who doesn't like to press a big red button? And second of all, if you press that subscribe button, then I'm sure that something amazing will happen. I'm not sure what. Maybe it'll dispense custard creams or something. Ooh, custard creams. That would be nice. But that being said, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And back to the video. Now it should be stated that that doesn't mean you should go around just lugging your limbs into random walls or random trees. 
I mean, for legal reasons, I very much need to say that. It's better to commit to a more long-term plan, and consider more exercises which work microly at first, and build up over time. A good example would be push-ups on the knuckles. Doing this sort of thing not only helps to harden the bones, but also helps to deaden the nerves around certain areas, making such activities as throwing a punch much less painful. Another classic example would be performing toe kicks, but more specifically, ones where you strike with the palm onto the shins. Not only does this help to practice our toe kicks, but it also helps to condition our palms as well as our shins. But that does not mean that there is not any reaction in such areas after a hit. Swelling occurs as fluid and white blood cells move into the injured area. The increase of swelling also includes a lovely inrush of chemicals that increase pain, making one less likely to use or touch a said area leaving it alone as it heals. You know, it's all well and good to, you know, learn about the backbone of the body. I mean, it's very good and such, but as ever, we need to go deeper. Now, this is a big topic, and one that certain naysayers will have a lot to say on the discussion. Oh, it's all genetics that's at play. Oh, you see that six foot two individual over there who can do a very long, long jump and bench press 315 kilograms. Well, it's obvious that it's all genetics at play. No hard work or training required. Don't try anything. Don't do anything. Man, I got bored just saying that. Other than being another peddling of the victim parade, is there any truth to it? A person's genetic traits can affect such areas as height, lung capacity, endurance, reflex speed, hand-eye coordination. With certain genetic markers such as the capital D, D genotype on the ACE gene, indicating greater speed and strength, while the upper GG genotypes in the NOS9 gene indicating greater endurance. But we all know those are not real factors when in the octagon or ring or on the mat, the dividing lines built by DNA can be brought down in moments by technique and hard work. But does this mean that if I were to have a child with someone who also does martial arts, that is, preferably a female, does that then mean that my child will be a kung fu fighting badass in the making, genetically primed to win any street fight, if he so inclined, or she? Well, to find out for certain, we need to break out the old Punnett Square, a fancy way of saying, figuring out the probability of what genotypes will lead to a certain child being born. And based on that, the odds are pretty good, actually. Now, I'm not exactly the strongest person in the world, standing at about 5'8", being more of a slim build sort of chap, and so I'm more the speedy sort with the reflexes and the brain and the speaking not well. So I'd say it's more, I'd say it's more of a mixed bag on my end. So assuming that, genetically speaking, the female I would be capitulating with is quite genetically similar to myself, so more of a mixed bag as well, then that would leave then a likelihood of one in two of said children to be also like us, a mixed bag. So have some of the genetics, but not all of them. One in four of them, but one in four would be an absolute chat and have all of the stats. Would be firing on all cylinders in strength, speed, coordination, balance, reflex speed, brain. And then the other one in four would be an absolute, yeah, oh dear. I think in that sense, then that child would be disowned. We, we don't talk about that one. Were I to have a child with someone who had no martial prowess whatsoever, as well as no real genetic what have you, then that would leave more of a 50-50 chance whether said child would have any martial arts proclivity whatsoever, or have none at all. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like those odds. Is this why eugenics was invented? But of course that's all semantics, because as we all know, when it comes to martial arts, any real traits that matter can be honed, can be trained, can be built up, can be mastered over time. It's more about technique that matters over time and training than any individual traits that you are just inherently born with. But even outside of martial arts, it's looking at this again which makes you realise just how incredibly complex and how incredibly amazing our individual bodies are. Just what's going on just in here, let alone everywhere else. Much rather a parallel to the amazing complexity of the universe around us, with so much complex, amazing, majestic stuff all going on all around us, all every single day, and all made up of all these tiny, microscopic, amazing, small moments as well. Much like how the whole sum of our bodies is made up of all this complex stuff, but then when you break it all down, it's all made of this tiny, amazing stuff all in the middle of it all. If you think about it like that, it makes it more evident just how much we are capable of individually. 
So in that respect, what are you waiting for? Do you have that passion for something? Do you want to go out into the world and find some adventure? Well, go ahead and do it! Why not? What's stopping you? And speaking of, that reminds me. There's a planet out there where it rained diamonds. Can you imagine that? Diamonds raining from the skies. And when the light refracts through them from the starlight overhead. Ah. Oh, beautiful. Or there's a mountain top that I know of. Sun rises from that mountain top. The purples, the blues, the brilliant oranges and yellows, the pinks just shining through. Brilliant. So, where to? <laughs>